Welcome to the More Miles podcast. I'm Lauren. I'm Scott. And I'm Michelle. And we are the More Miles Run Coaching team. We are chatting today about nutrition. This is a big topic. <laughs> we have a lot of interest in this topic, and it's something that I think comes up really frequently with athletes, with people in general. I think um, nutrition is really interesting, and we have a lot that we can dive into and cover, and gracious, we could take this into probably 10 different episodes in 10 different directions. Um, what we're going to try to cover today is the basics, um, specifically for runners uh, and for athletes, um, but specifically for runners as athletes, Ath athletes that are runners. <laughs> we are going to be talking about pre-run, on the run, post-run, hydration, daily nutrition fueling. Um, so I think we're going to cover a lot of content here. Um, so bear with us. And again, there is a lot to cover here. So if we don't get through everything or we don't answer all of the questions, we will expand upon um, what we record today. So, okay, let's get started. We're gonna start right at the beginning with pre-run fueling. Um, so this is a, a huge question that, that people have and we were asked, we um, put out a call for Q&A on this topic and it was a, a common question is, pre-run, um, what should you be eating? Should you be eating? Um, when, when should you eat and what kinds of things should you be having? Um, I, Michelle, why don't I throw that one to you first, um, on pre-run, do we need to be eating before every run every day? No. So, um, that's a misconception that kind of circulates around. Um, and honestly, I, personally do not fuel before my recovery runs or my easy runs. Um, if they're shorter distance, um, anything under an hour, I won't fuel unless it's a workout or a long run. I typically will just have coffee and cream beforehand. Um, cause you're going easy. You don't really need it. You're not burning a ton of carbs. Your body has the stores that, um, you need to get through your run just fine. Um, however, if there is a workout, um, or a run over 90 minutes, I will 100% recommend that you have something to eat beforehand. Um, and I typically tell my athletes that they should have 30 grams of carbohydrates about 30 minutes before their run. So that way you have time to digest them. They're simple sugars, um, you know, quick, uh, quick digesting. That's the word I'm looking for. Quick digesting sugars that um, you will hit your body pretty quickly here. So that way they're in your system ready to go when you start your run. Um, and that can look like a few different things. It can look like a gel before your run. Um, and even gels, you can go as close as 15 minutes before your runs. Um, it could be toast with a little bit of peanut butter on it. It could be a bagel. Um, and we talked about pop tarts. Um, and for people who can't eat before run, um, like I personally struggle with getting solid food in before early runs, you can make them liquid. So a juice is a great example. Um, one of my favorites is Shalane's sports drink that you can find in the run fast, eat slow cookbooks. And it's got like tart cherry juice and um, coconut water and salt and blackstrap molasses. So you get a bunch of electrolytes and carbohydrates in its liquid form. Um, but there's a bunch of different ways you can do that. But typically 30 grams of carbohydrates, 30 minutes before long runs and workouts is what I recommend. And the rest, it's personal choice. Um, fasted is great because you can work on fat, ad fat adaption. But if you need to eat before your runs, you should eat before your runs. I think that's an important topic to highlight because a lot of what we see right now in, especially in the running community, um, if you follow other runners, if you follow sports specific uh, dietitians, a lot of the culture um, around fueling right now is that you must fuel for every run, every time, do not head out the door without putting food in your system. Um, and I think I want to make sure to explain that comes from a, a place of good intention. Um, historically, uh, since you know, like the '80s, there has been a pandemic of underfueling in in our sport um, as runners. That runners are habitually getting themselves into trouble. Um, some of it is disordered eating. Some of it is just um, rampant underfueling unintentionally. Um, and so this, this message that you must fuel for every run all the time, no fasted runs is 
kind of swinging backward from that. Um, and I think it's important to emphasize if that is something that you have struggled with or you do struggle with, then it is important to put something in your system before every run, every time. Um, but that doesn't necessarily apply to everybody. That's not a hard and fast rule for every runner all of the time. Um, so in answering that question for yourself, take a look at your own history. If underfueling is something that you have had a struggle with chronically or, or repeatedly, eating something before you go run is a good idea. Um, However, if that's not something that you struggle with, or or maybe you are someone who overfuels and has a, a weight loss goal or something like that, um, it's okay. And, and heck, it's convenient to go out for your easy runs and your recovery runs without taking fuel. Um, so maybe even think of it that way from a, a convenient standpoint. If you are going, like Michelle said, 60 minutes or less is a, is a good rule of thumb and low effort. If you are putting out a low effort for that day, you don't have to fuel necessarily. And it is okay to go out with just coffee in your system, just water with electrolytes in your system. Um, you don't necessarily have to eat beforehand. Um, but I liked a lot of those ideas that you threw out there. So I wanted to ask each of you, let's, let's look at, um, I think all of us are about the same. I think we pretty much adhere to that philosophy of if it's an easy day, we're probably just going to have some coffee and head out the door. If it's a long run day, we're going to be a little bit more um, regimented in our fueling for that day. So um, Scott, when you have a, a long run day or even just any run during the week, what does your personal pre-run routine look like? Yeah, so my routine starts actually the night before I lay it out on the counter um, because I, my entire running life have up until about maybe a year or two ago, pretty much ran every run fasted. Um, and, and there was no science behind it. There was really just, it, it felt better for me, um, you know, to not have anything sloshed around in my stomach. Um, so that, that was a really hard habit to break when I really knew I needed to put the uh, you know, food into, you know, my routine. So I put it out, I lay it out on the counter. Um, you know, typically it's, uh, you know, maybe half a banana. Um, I'm really big on honey. I, I love honey. So it, I will literally take it like a teaspoon of honey and slurp it down. It's liquid. It's not really sloshing around. I do that. Um, I've got a toaster out there. So I love toast. You know, that seems to be light for me. Um, but I think for my routine, it's, it's laying it out there. You know, I'll have everything laid out on the counter so I don't have to think about it. It's just there and ready to go. Perfect. I, I like that of thinking about it the night before, because when you wake up in the morning, it is so easy to, you're groggy, you're tired and you got to get the work done. It's easy to just roll right out the door. Um, so I like that thinking about it ahead of time. And, and doing the math ahead of time on, on what you need to put in. Um, Michelle, how about you? What do you have before a, a big workout or a long run? So, um, yeah, before my long runs, if they're easy, I'm, I'm kind of not eating a ton of carbs. Um, I'll take them more on the run with me. I would have a gel about 15 minutes before because I'm, I start them really early. So I'm not hungry first thing in the morning. So I'll have my coffee. Um, and one of my coffees, I'll put like bulletproof creamer in. So it has some of those MCT oil like in there, which, you know, may give some energy, um, but fills me up a little bit more. And then I'll take a gel. And that's if I have an early run, like I'm talking like 5, 6 a.m. start. If it's later on in the day when I start, I will have like a piece of toast with peanut butter or a little bit of oatmeal with peanut butter mixed in. Um my go-tos are sometimes those perfect bars, which they sell just because it has a little bit of protein in it. So it keeps me fuller longer. Um, I don't get that hunger pain when I'm running long distances that even a gel won't satisfy just so I have something solid in my stomach before I start, but it's also quick and easy and I can even eat it in the car if I'm driving somewhere else for my run. Um, those are my go-tos really. And then, you know, workouts are the same. I will have, um, like a, you know, the sports drink I mentioned, like I love that before hard workouts, just so I'm also prehydrated and I have my electrolytes in um, and I'll add a gel before that. I'm just not a hungry person generally in the morning. So mine are very small. Yeah, I'm pretty much the same. I, um, I have a similar history to Scott that there was a very long period of time that I did every run fasted, even if it was a long run or, or a hard workout and adjusting 
uh, back from that, I, for a long time, had a really hard time putting food in my system and then going to run. Um, so I really like the idea of having a gel. If you are someone who feels that way, that you're about to go do a high intensity session or a long run and you know you need to put something in your system, but you can't tolerate putting whole food in your system. Um, sports nutrition works really well. If, if a gel that you already know works for you on the run is a good option. Sports drink is a good option to the point, Michelle, that you made. You're also with a sports drink getting electrolytes in there in addition to calories. Um, but because I have come from this side of never fueling to this side of all, uh, often fueling, I won't say always, um, I have so many ideas. <laughs> I've tried so many different things. Um, at this point, every single day I have coffee with half and half every day. That's my morning routine. And then I have a large cup, especially in the summer. It's a large, like 32 ounce cup of water with electrolytes. I'm not having quite that much in the winter when I'm not sweating so much. Um, so that's every day, even if it's an easy run recovery run. And then if it's a higher intensity session or a long run, my absolute favorite is graham crackers. They are simple carbohydrates. There is, um, almost no fat and almost no protein, which is something I don't like in my system. I'm really going for a low fiber, low fat, um, because the something higher fiber can lead to digestive problems on your run. Um, for me, fats and proteins just don't sit well uh, before a run. So I really like to go for a, a pure carbohydrate when I can. Graham crackers are about as simple as it comes. Um, they always work. So, and you can measure them out pretty quickly. Like two sheets is a serving size. If you're going out for a really long run, maybe you grab three sheets. Like it, it's pretty easy to do the math on it. Um, I also really like oatmeal and I'll do that with like without any fat added. So no oil or butter in it, just a plain oatmeal with maple syrup um, and keep it pretty simple there. But that's, it's going to take a little bit longer to digest because it has a little bit more fiber in it. So you've got to have some more time for something like that. Applesauce, I really like. Um, Pop-Tarts are the bomb diggity if you are going out for a big effort um, because a, a package of Pop-Tarts, the two Pop-Tarts, for one, as an adult, eating Pop-Tarts is like really satisfying because that's not a food that we usually eat. They're not particularly healthy for you because they're really high in carbohydrates. Two Pop-Tarts has like 70, I think, grams of carbohydrates. So if you're going out for a really big effort, that fuel is a great way to start your day. Um, and it, again, <laughs> kind of makes you happy to get to eat a Pop-Tart and know you're just going to go put it to use. You don't really need to worry about it. Um, applesauce is another, I don't know if I said that one already. That's another like really gentle, almost like a sports gel, um, really gentle on your stomach. So the, the main point we want to hammer home is that on your pre-run nutrition, when you do take in fuel before the run, you want to keep it simple. We are not looking for vegetables uh, before you go run, things that have a lot of fiber in them. Um, again, for that reason, because that can create stomach issues um, as you get into your run. So we're looking for your simple carbohydrates on your pre-run fueling. Um, again, lots of examples there for you. Um, then we're going to move on to fueling on the run. Um, and this is a this is a big one. We're going to get into math on this one. Um, does one of you want to start with on the run fueling what we are looking at? Why don't we start with um, what, when do we need to be carrying calories and nutrition with us on the run? Yeah, I'll let Michelle talk about the science and numbers, but um, <laughs> I would say long runs and hard workouts uh, is when you should be carrying um, calories on the run. Um, and then from there, it just it, it, it's a matter of how long is that run? How long is your long run? Um, how long is your is your is your workout session, et cetera? But those those two right, at, I guess, at the at the top is is at minimum. Yeah. When you should be carrying calories now from a number standpoint, again, then it breaks down to how long. Right. And how much do you actually need to carry? Yeah. So before Michelle's going to get into this in a second, but I want to expand upon that. Not necessarily restricting to just 
workouts and long runs, but when we're getting over 90 minutes and on occasion for some athletes that can also be an easy or recovery run, um, especially for our high mileage marathon athletes or our ultra athletes, um, or even someone who is new to running and running on a time-based program, sometimes an easy and recovery run can go long. Um, so a 90 minute threshold, I would expand upon. Typically that's going to be our workouts and our long runs. Yeah. Sorry, Michelle, I interrupted no. you. That was great. No, it's great. Um, so anyway, building on what Lauren said, anything over 90 minutes, you want to have two or 300 calories per hour. Um, and when you break that down, really what you want to look at is the grams of carbohydrates, because that's what you're really replenishing in most situations. Now, ultra runners will be replacing pretty much all macros because um, they're out there for so long. But just for on the run stuff, you're looking about, it's, that equates to about 50 or 60 grams of carbohydrates per hour. Um, and most gels have 20 to 30 grams um, in a packet of twos or gels. So that's two, one or two per hour. To, oh, it's about two per hour. Um, so every 30 minutes, you should be basically taking a gel, some chews or whatever. Now, the caveat to that is if you have carbohydrates in your sports drink, you can kind of deduct that from what you need to take from your gel. So if you have scratch or tailwind or Gatorade endurance, they all have carbohydrates in them. And you need to look at the label and how you've mixed it. Um, if you're mixing it from the powder, make sure the number of scoops you're putting into your pack, you figure out how much you're going to be drinking on average per hour. And then you can deduct that from the number of gels you need to take per hour and kind of maybe space it out every 40 minutes or 45 minutes. Um, and, it's, and it's an experiment because um, especially if you're new to fueling, it's going to be a lot and your stomach's going to feel weird. Your teeth are going to get that weird coating on them and you're just going to kind of hate carbs. Um, so I, I usually tell people start with every 45 minutes, start with a gel every 45 minutes. So you get into the habit of taking it and then start backing that up at five minutes every week. So then 40 minutes, 35 minutes, 30 minutes until you've hit that point where your gut is trained. Do you feel like you can take those on without feeling ill effects from GI upset? Because it does take training, just like you're running, you build up slowly, you build the carbs up slowly. Um, so yeah, in, in there, you need to take you know, 200 on the low end, 300 on the high end. So race day, you want to be closer to that 300. Um, you know, your midweek workouts, you might be able to do 200. It just depends on the intensity of what you're doing. So I really like that point you made of do something, right? Like a lot, I think a lot of people um, are not fueling at all and don't know where to start. And we throw out the, we throw out these numbers a lot. And I think you also, if you follow running culture online, you see a, two to 300 calories an hour is the standard. That is the general recommendation. Um, that's a lot if you're not doing anything. And so it can feel really overwhelming. Um, so I really like your recommendation of start somewhere, take something. Um, it doesn't have to be that perfect 200, 300 to start. It doesn't have to be every 30 minutes to start, but you've got to start somewhere. Um, I think that two to 300 calorie range even can feel overwhelming. And again, I think it is more common that people are not reaching that 200 number. Um, so we really want to emphasize, focus on that first. 200 calories per hour. We don't, you don't even need to worry about the two to 300 range to start. Focus on 200 calories per hour to start. Now, how you get there, uh, like Michelle said, there are so many different sports nutrition products out there. Um, it is very, the most common that you're going to see are gels and chews that are in the range of about 100 calories per serving or per packet that you have with you, that's 25 grams of carbohydrate. So to reach your 200 calories per hour, you've got to take two of those every hour. That's going to come out to 50 grams of carbohydrates, 200 calories. Um, now you've got to look at the package of what you're using and do the math on that um, because that's not, that's not perfect. Um, there are gels out there that are 200 calories themselves and you only need to take one per hour. Um, and you are going to have to experiment with, okay, I need to take two gels per hour. That doesn't mean you're taking two at once when you hit the 60 minute mark. That means you're spacing them out 30 minutes or 40 minutes or, um, but I really want to emphasize how important it is to do the math, to look at the nutrition label of the product that you're using, 
see how many, see what the serving size is, first of all, see how many calories it has, how many carbohydrates it has, and make a plan for when you're going to take them and how many you need in a given run. Um, and, and you've got to do that in advance. If you are just grabbing something and kind of winging it, there's a great chance that you're not getting the fueling that you need while you're out there. Um, which leads into a whole nother question. Um, where do we, where do we find this stuff? Like if you are new to fueling or maybe you're interested in fueling in a different way, uh, how do you know what works for you? Like, where do you start? Yeah. So there's like a lot of options out there. I mean, there's tons. Um, and you just have to experiment. Um, cause what works great for one person, you know, you, there's, you know, there's always the elite that does one Boston and they talk about whatever they fueled with, but that might be the complete wrong thing for you to use. So you just need to try, um, different products and you can go, um, you know, your local running store has, um, different sports stores, but the feed is our go-to at more miles. Um, we all have discounts here. So the feed is great because you can order a single of almost anything. So you can order one gel of this brand, one gel, of, you know, even different flavors and then mix and match and take those and experiment with them on the run. So um, I would say make sure that you take the same gel when you're experimenting. So order enough of one gel for your entire run. So you're not mixing it up and not don't know which gel didn't work. So, you know, try brand A and order three of those. So, you know, it lasts for your hour and a half run or four of this other one for your two hour run. Um, and test them out and see which ones feel good, which ones don't upset your stomach, which flavors you like, what you're going to stick to. It's just like exercise. Find what you're going to use that you're going to stick with. And that works. It doesn't matter which brand um, it winds up being as long as you're getting the fuel you need. So the feed.com, this is going to sound like a, a plug or an advertisement and it's not, they are not sponsoring this podcast. Um, they do sponsor our team. So, um, every athlete on the more miles run squad is sponsored by the feed.com. However, aside from that, I think we would promote the store anyway, because it's, it's very unique. Um, Scott, I'll let you elaborate on it a little bit. What is the feed.com? Yeah, so the feed.com, it's an online store, right, that you that you can go to and it sells sports nutritional products. So it, it, it sells gels, it sells bars, it sells, you know, hydration, um, everything you can think of. And so uh, when you go there, you can actually select um, the product you want. Like, let's say, for example, and I actually used uh, the feed about a year ago and figured out very quickly that, hey, I love Morton gels, right? But I had never used one before. So I picked one. It allows you to pick one gel right or you can pick more than one you can pick like 12. um and so yeah it's it's an online store that you can order um if you want hydration right and 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 the, and the biggest thing i think to michelle's point is that you get to test out certain products and so if you're afraid of um you know having to go out to you know your retail store and buy let's say a box of gels a 24 case and you hate the first one that you take you know you can eliminate that fear right by just test test trying it um so yeah that, that that's really kind of from an intense standpoint what it's what it's there for and, and and the benefits of it it's pretty awesome they almost everything in now they carry all products they are not brand specific they carry almost everything that's on the market um is available on the feed.com and almost everything is available in single serving size including things like protein recovery shakes and greens nutrition drinks you can buy in single serving sizes um so yeah it's it's fantastic if you know what you like um you know we enjoy that we we get a sponsorship and we get uh to spend money in their store but if you don't know what you like it is the best place and we were talking about this before i think the only place that we know of that you can browse that many brands in one place and buy single servings. You don't have to commit to buying a whole package of something. Um, so you really can try a lot of different things. You can try solid food. You can try gels. You can try um, a lot of different products. And to elaborate on that a little bit, um, I often have runners come to me um, who say, I don't like gels. I can't do gels. I can't stand them. Um, and I want to emphasize that in 2023, 
sports nutrition gels look a lot different than they used to five years ago, 10 years ago. Um, a lot of what we see now is not the thick, like, I don't even know, slime style stuff that you are choking and gagging down and <laughs> is going to upset your stomach. Um, nutrition technology is really cool. Um, and the, the science that's coming out on how we can best absorb things, how we can best digest things is really progressing and advancing fast. Um, so a lot of the gels that you're going to see now are very liquid, um, really easy to swallow without water. Um, they make hydrogels that are like kind of a mix in between. You could chew it if you wanted to, you could swallow it down like a, like a shot. Um, really, really easy to take in and not the gels that you have seen in the past. Um, so I, I encourage runners, even if you're already fueling and have a product you've been using for a long time, to try some new stuff anyway, because there's so much interesting and, and better products available now. Um, and that's only continuing to, to grow and expand. Um, yeah. And if you're so, training for, for long ultras, I, I can attest that you put a, a few Morton gels in, in your pack and about two hours in, it tastes like a toasted marshmallow. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard you say that before. And it's the best. I'll take your word for it. <laughs> um, before we leave on the run fueling, um, I wanna talk a little bit about, so we have just finished talking about gels and chews as our primary um, source of calories on the run, but liquid calories are something to consider also. So um what are liquid calories and what are the pros and cons of using something liquid as opposed to a gel or a chew packet yeah so liquid calories um like we mentioned are scratch tailwind similar drinks where they have a certain amount of carbohydrates that you, you know in the powder mix and they have electrolytes in them usually too so they typically contain your carbohydrates and your electrolytes in a single drink and that's great for some people um but i don't recommend it for everyone um, if you are a high salt sweater or you're a heavy sweater, that may not be a good option for you because you're going to lose so much more electrolytes than the drink can replace without overdoing your carbohydrates. So you can easily overdo your carbohydrates, which we kind of didn't talk about, which will give you some GI upset, really, maybe cramping. It's not going to feel good. Um, and you don't want to get to that point either. So there's like too much of a good thing as well. So um, it's good if you're, you know, you don't, some people really don't sweat a lot, so they can take that in at a reasonable pace and sustain both electrolytes and carbohydrates at once. Um, you can mix it more concentrated, but at the same time, you're going to lose, you're going to have so many more carbohydrates with your electrolytes. So it gets, it's kind of a trial and error thing, um, unless you get like a sweat test done, um, which will break down your electrolyte loss and sweat loss, which is super awesome. And I recommend everyone do it. Um, but I, I personally like to separate them. I don't take carbohydrates in my liquids. I like pure electrolytes in my drink. And I like to keep my gels pure carbohydrates without electrolytes. So that way you can really dial in your personal needs um, that way. Michelle, can I ask a question? Because I actually, as you're, as you're saying that, it, it, it actually, for me, right? Like I, I have a hard time distinguishing between liquid calories right? And electro electrolytes you put into your water that have calories. So for example, I look at Scratch, I love it. And it's taken me a long time to, to find, you know, that product that I like. It's got 80 calories per scoop. I, I have mm -hmm. multiple handhelds during a run. So I know I'm going to get, let's say, 320 calories just in Scratch. Mm -hmm. But I don't necessarily look at that as liquid calories, right? I think in the term liquid calories, I'm thinking of those higher ones, like, you know, you see the you know, name the brand, right? That have like 240 calories right. per 18 ounces you mix in, right? So it, how would you kind of help somebody kind of, I guess, navigate through that of distinguishing? Because I myself just have a tough time of splitting those two, right? Yeah. So something like Scratch, it has not enough calories to get you through an hour. You know, like if you drink that by itself, it's not going to be enough for you to sustain, you know, especially on ultra. So it's great as a supplement, like to take that in addition to your on the run fuel, just make sure you test it. So, you know, you're not overdoing it, but that's going to probably put you to towards that 300 calorie per hour. If you're taking two gels with that, with your scratch, you're still in that range. And that's great. You're getting more carbohydrates and that's going to just continue to fuel you. So it's not bad to combine them at all. 
Um, and I think if you're somebody who struggles with getting enough carbohydrates, that's actually a really good strategy to get, it's a supplement. So you, that like those lower, lower calorie ones are great to supplement your solid. I say solid. It's not really solid gel fuels or maybe chews or whatever you choose. Um, the higher calorie ones, I feel like Gatorade Endurance is pretty high calorie, if I remember correctly. Um, I don't normally use that one, so I don't know the details of it. That one you may need to be paying a little more attention and do a little more math with because it's a little sugary. Um, one that I think that is very are pretty good is supplements. Yeah, one that I think is very popular, and again, just popped into my head, and I don't know the answer to this. Like Goo Roctane, is that oh. is that higher calorie, or is that would be on the lower end supplemental? Goo Roctane is really high calorie. Um, it is 350, 350 calories per serving. So it's oh. higher calorie than Tailwind. Um, and it's it's way up there in carbohydrates. So, um, but it it's thin, it goes down easily. Um, this is, Michelle, you brought up a good point because we didn't talk about overfueling. Um, and because that is, not a problem for most people. It, it is more common that we see people who are under fueling um, or not getting enough on the run. But liquid calories is where you can dive into over fueling. Um, and essentially, when you are running, your your blood is pumping, your your heart is pumping, your blood is being distributed to your muscles as the priority because they are working the hardest and your digestive system is not getting the same blood flow that it would get when you're just sitting at rest um, or, or going through normal daily activities. So your digestion is slowed down. You can't absorb what's coming into your system in the same way that you would absorb it if you were just sitting on the sofa. Um, so there is a limit to how much your stomach can tolerate on the run. There's a limit to how much your stomach can tolerate, period. Um, but on the run, we have some pretty good science on that. And it's roughly around 100 grams of carbohydrates. But we are even now learning that with training, you can even push a little bit higher than that and absorb more than 100 grams of, 100 grams of carbohydrate. However, you really got to train that like that is a thing you need to practice and be very intentional about. And it's not for most people. Um, so don't take that as a guideline that this is what you should be reaching for. This is just what we know to be the upper limit of what a, an athlete's stomach could, can handle. Um, when you are using liquid calories, those numbers go up really quickly and, and especially in the summer months. So like Michelle said, when you are sweating and you're losing a lot of fluid, um, you're going to want to drink a lot of fluid to replace that. You need to, to, to stay healthy and to keep your electrolytes in balance in your system. Um, but your stomach can only take so much calories. So you are going to need to take in more fluid and more electrolytes than you are capable of taking in because of the heavy carb content in those drinks. Um, and that's where you can see either someone is not adequately hydrating and runs into problems because their stomach can't take in more of the liquid calories, or um, they take in so much of it because they're so thirsty, they end up puking on the side of the road. Um, so, and those are both scenarios that we want to avoid. Um, so really, especially in the warm weather, um, again, I have the same recommendation, recommendation as Michelle is to keep them separate. Um, keep your, your hydration separate from your calories, hydration in your bottle, calories in your pocket is, is what we usually recommend. Um, but to Scott's point, when you're using a low calorie hydration drink, um, that is something that is not going to clog up your system. It's not enough calories to clog up your system, especially knowing that we can reach up to that 100 grams per hour potential. Um, but it, it can just add a little bit to your fueling. Um, I think it's also important to note that with liquid calories, not every product has electrolytes in it. So you could be taking a liquid calorie supplement that is your drink but you're not actually getting electrolytes with it. Morton is one of those. The the Morton, oh, I can't even remember what the numbers are. There's two different drink mixes um, and they're very popular. But they have no electrolytes in them. So if you are drinking that and it's your you think it's your source of hydration as well as your calorie source, you're gonna be in trouble 
Um, and, and we have athletes that have experienced that before because they assume the drink mix has electrolytes and that product specifically doesn't. Um, and it's, it's not the only one out there, but it's probably the most popular. Oh, excuse me. Um, okay. That's on the run fueling, I think, for the most part. I think we could probably even expand more upon that. But those those are your basics. We are targeting a minimum 200 calories per hour for runs 90 minutes or more. Um, and above that 200 calorie mark is really personal and specific to the individual, to the event they're training for, for the intensity of the run that they are going for or training for. Um, but what we really want to be striving for is to reach that minimum 200 calories and, and start there. And then we can experiment more beyond that. But the, the 200 calorie mark is the gold standard that is healthy and productive for everybody and where we want to be reaching. And if you're um, not used to doing that, you got to practice it. It's true. And it's a chore, right? Like yeah. it's not, you really do, it's practice and you really do have to sit down and do the math and read the labels. Like it takes a little bit of work. It does yeah. take a lot, especially race day. Even if you trained with it, it's hard. Like you don't want to take those last two jaws. I'll tell you like that mile 22 gel <laughs> marathon is like the last thing you want to put in your mouth. It takes, it takes discipline. It's like setting timers on your watch um, every 30 minutes or 45, wherever you're at. It's the only way to go. Um, Cause you will forget and you won't want to do those, those towards the end of those really long runs. You're not going to want to take it, but you need it. Yeah. What, and, one thing also too is um, a, a, a scenario that you're probably, if, if you're going to run an ultra, I'll use that as example. Um, Cause that's what I'm training for. And that's, you know, kind of what I, what I preach is that, you know, you, you're going to have eight stations in an ultra, right. And a 50 miler, you're going to have your eight stations laid out and you can take advantage of some of the fuel that they're going to have there. But in practice, if you're training and you're going out for a very long run, practice it. Right. And sometimes I give tips of just, you know, do some loops, right. So you know, if you have to go back to your car and refuel, right. So you don't have to carry it on your person the entire way. Um, think about that, that kind of thing too, right? Cause sometimes I've, I've heard even the, the simple things of, I don't want to carry eight gels and I don't want to carry an extra pack of powder to put in water, you know, think about those things and practice the kind of your own little loops, because again, in a race or your event, you'll probably be able to take advantage of some of the fuel that's there at the aid stations. And you're not going to have that in practice. Yeah. But that's, a, I mean, that's a good point too, to bring up because I think you need to train if you don't want to carry, I would say as much fuel on your races. I mean, I work with like marathon, half marathon. So like uh, that's where my brain kind of goes. There are aid stations. We don't have the awesome glorious ones that you get on your races, but we have something. Um, but I think if you're planning to use race fuel, which I don't always recommend for a few reasons, um, you need to practice with the fuel, study the flavor, study the exact fuel and try to like say, okay, they're going to give those little Gatorade cups at mile three. So that's probably two ounces, maybe three. If you're fortunate, practice fueling only with that much fuel at that point in your training runs and get it as exact as you can to make sure that strategy works. But there's another side. I mean, if you plan on the race day fueling, just know there can be errors. Um, I, when I raced Atlantic city half marathon, there was an aid station missing. A whole aid station was completely gone where I was expecting one to be. And that's the one fuel station I was counting on. So I would still say if you're planning on using those aid stations, still carry something with you because stuff happens and it doesn't always go according to plans or they run out of something that you were hoping for. So I think, um, you know, you can train to run with less fuel, but I would never recommend one of my athletes not carry something with them for a longer race. I think that's an excellent point and, and something I'm glad you brought up because we wouldn't have touched on it otherwise, um, especially in, it's especially common in road racing that you have frequent aid stations, which is fantastic, but you have no idea what you're going to get. It, you get a cup, it could be filled this much, it could be filled this much, and you don't know until you pick it up. You also don't know what the concentration is. Did they overmix it? Is it under diluted? Um, you have no idea. And so, especially if you have a, very, a specific goal in mind and you are going there to work hard, not to just 
cover the distance or finish the event, but to really push yourself um, for a, a speed or a time. It is, I think we would say recommended to carry your own stuff so that you know what you're getting. And to the point of practicing, um, if you're not going to be using the aid station stuff, so to be honest, like the the gels that you find at the aid stations in most road races is going to be the old, thick stuff that none of us like that t is horrible and you got to gag it down because it's cheap. And, you know, you got to, you got to, figure out how to make this work. So most commonly what you'll find is gels that you probably don't want to take. Um, and so you are going to want to carry your own nutrition source. And that's something you have to practice. If you're running a marathon, you might have to carry eight gels on you to fuel every 30 minutes or maybe more, depending on how long you're going to be out there. You got to figure out where to put that stuff. Like, you need to make sure you have shorts that have pockets that you're comfortable carrying in or figure out how to stuff it into your sports bra that is not going to chafe on your chest or um, that is a whole thing that you need to practice. So I think in long runs, it's it's okay to, it is a lot to carry. And, and I know sometimes it's just easier to do a loop around your house or to come back to your car. I do that all the time, especially in the summer, because I'm already fighting the heat. I'm already fighting the humidity. I don't want to have to carry two pounds of extra stuff too. Um, but as you get closer to race day, it is important to practice that. How are you going to carry this stuff if you're going to be relying on your own nutrition? And unless you know that what works for you on the, that what is on the course works for you, you are safer to be carrying your own nutrition. You know it's going to work and you're not taking taking a gamble with the, the aid stations. In an ultra, I would say you've got a little bit more room there because aid stations are typically expansive. Um, and we tend to carry a vest uh, or a hydration pack or something like that that you've got a whole lot more storage. It's a lot easier to carry. Um, but for road racing specifically, practicing how this is going to work and and practicing taking fuels when you're running at race pace is is a thing that's important to do also um okay on the run nutrition i think we've we've got a good basic start there so okay post run um moving on you have finished your workout um then what then what do we do we have let's talk about different types of runs because it is a little bit different um an easy run versus a higher intensity session or a longer run how should we be fueling when we're done i i say protein first um you know a lot of my runs are going to be done on a trail uh which i don't have a trailhead right out my back door it's at least 20 minute 15 minute drive um so i carry a shaker uh, a, a, like thermos, it's insulated. So, um, put it in the car, it's ready to go. So when I'm driving home, I'm drinking that, you know, protein first and especially on harder efforts, um, you know, then I'll also try and get, get in some carbs, you know, to, to replenish that. But the timing is key. Um, and especially, you know, for me, for example, my harder workouts and my long runs, are more destination. I'm not at home. I don't come right into the door and have my fridge right there. So I got to put it in, you know, a cooler and a, and a, and a thermos, a, a protein shake, um, take some planning ahead. But, uh, but for me, that's, that's, that's what I do. Yeah. That's similar to how I operate. I mean, my easier runs, if I didn't, you know, like a recovery run, I, I don't really stress. I kind of come home and just have a normal breakfast, which might be a couple eggs, which still has some protein in it, um, like avocado toast or whatever. But my harder efforts, I'm like, Scott, I go get my protein shake in right away. Cause usually after those hard efforts, I'm not hungry still. <laughs> like, I guess I just, I'm not like a hungry person <laughs> until later in the day, but it's hard to get that in after a hard workout. You're, you know, you've got your adrenaline running and you just don't feel like eating, but I'm usually pretty thirsty. So I can make a protein shake pretty quickly with like, um, usually I put like coconut milk with a scoop, scoop of protein powder and some berries in there. So I get the carbs and protein right away. I get a good hit right there. Um, those are, you know, my big ones or I'll have, um, like, you know, add a tangerine to it for some extra carbs right away. But that's my usual go-to. Um, if it's just a long run, I'll do more yogurt with berries and some protein powder mixed in just so I have some more substance in my stomach. But it's basically just variations of the same, the same few foods just mixed up differently, I guess. <laughs> 
Well, that's okay. I think that's a good thing. I Maybe we could get into that more a little bit later, but having your routine and your go-to, that's rely- you know you're getting the nutrients that you need. And I think I think people have in their mind that they need to be creative and they need to eat a different thing every day of the week. And that's just not true. That's really overcomplicating it. Um, so I think I think it's good to have those go-tos and those things that are just, you know, you like it, it's easy, it's convenient, like that's okay. You don't have to reinvent your meal every day or, or every week. Yeah, and I, love, I, mean, I love going to, and we've talked about this guy, like just your protein, like your yogurt, protein powder, berries, like whatever, or your protein shake. It's easy because it's cheap. The same few ingredients, you know, groceries are expensive. Like get the same ingredient, the same throughout the week, and then you buy just a few of them versus changing it up every day. You don't have to buy a thousand different ingredients. It's the same stuff. Keep some frozen berries, keep some yogurt, and a thing of protein powder. It's three things you have to buy that cover all your bases. So I think it's important to mention, um, and Scott touched on it, that the timing of your post-run nutrition matters. Um, this is especially important when you've done a higher intensity session, um, like a speed workout or a long run. Um, when we are doing high intensity effort, we are doing damage to your muscle fibers. And in order to heal, we need to give them protein. We need to give them the building blocks to heal and repair that damage that we've done. Um, the sooner, the better after a higher intensity session. So the rule of thumb is that you want to be getting protein into your system within 30 to 60 minutes after a high intensity session, really more toward that 30 minute end if we can. Um, on an easy run or a recovery run, you still want to be following your workout with re pro replenishing your protein. That timing window becomes a little bit more flexible because you're not doing as much damage. Your body is not as desperate for that recovery need. So, you know, maybe you're floating up toward that 60 minute end of the window and that's okay. Um, but the, what we are looking for is 30 to 40 grams of protein after a workout, especially a high intensity session. That number is maybe surprising to some people. It's a lot. Um, and I will emphasize when we give that 30 to 40 gram range, um, the older that you are, the more important it is to be on the top end of that range. We don't recover like we used to in, I'll say our forties and above, but the truth is really, and, and it's, especially for women, it starts in your thirties. Um, and it is really important to be getting adequate protein into your system to repair that damage that you're doing. So 40 grams of protein sounds like a lot, um, but it's important. And, and I think both of you are already mentioned you're doing it. I'm doing it too. A, a protein shake is probably the easiest way to get that done. You are not hungry for a steak right after you finish your run. You're not hungry for a, five eggs or, you know, whatever it is to come out to 40 grams of protein. Um, so a, a protein shake is really convenient. It can be inexpensive if you're making it yourself. Um, whey protein isolate is a great product that has a full amino acid profile. If you do not do animal products, pea protein is your next best bet on um, plant-based protein options that you are getting the essential amino acids that you need to stimulate that muscle protein synthesis that we're looking for. Um, that's my go-to also. I am, I can't scarf down a meal right after I eat. Um, and I'm usually am thirsty. So I use uh, protein powder just with ice and water and it's unflavored protein powder. So then I have like a stevia um, flavored mix thing that I put in. And we've got all sorts of different flavors. We've got vanilla and chocolate and caramel. So depending on the season, you know, make whatever sounds good. And then I'll also put some salt in there because I just finished a hard workout and almost always I would like some salt to go with it. Um, and then, especially if it's a long run or a particularly difficult um, or high in, high demand session, in addition to the protein shake, I'm going to try to eat a meal probably within another hour after that. Once my stomach has and my system has had a chance to calm down, I'm not going to have that protein shake and treat that as a meal. Um, it's not. It's sort of like your immediate Band-Aid after the workout. You still need to eat real food too 
it's just giving you a little bit more of a buffer um, between when you finish your workout and when you have an appetite for a real meal. Um, so maybe that that's, oh, I, I wanted to mention too, I, I think we all talked about mixing our own protein shake that we take with us in the car or have at home. Um, another idea I wanted to throw out, because this is so easy and it's really easy on race day also to throw like in your drop bag. Um, Core Power Elite is a, um, it's like a milk brand and it's, they make a, an elite protein shake. It's called Core Power Elite. It comes in vanilla, chocolate, strawberry, and it's 41 grams of protein. And it also has carbohydrates in it. I forget how much because that's not what I focus on. 41 grams of protein in the single serving bottle. And it tastes like a milkshake. It is delicious. Um, it doesn't have to be refrigerated. So you can throw it in your drop bag for the end of a race. Um, it's not going to taste good after sitting in your hot car, but it's not going to go bad after sitting in your hot car if, uh, if you have to. Um, so if you don't want to make your own protein shake or it's not convenient for you, um, that is probably one of the best off the store products that is clean ingredients. You're not putting garbage and a bunch of like supplements that you don't understand what they are into your system. Um, and it tastes great. My kids even like them. Um, not that they drink them often with that much protein, but, uh, it tastes like a milkshake. They're delicious. So I wanted to throw that one out there too, for quick grab, easy kind of, kind of stuff. Um, but I think that segues us into, you know, talking about your protein shake after your workout doesn't cut it. You've got to, there's got to be more after that. Um, a lot of questions that we have are on then what, okay. We've fueled for our run. We, before the run, we fueled on our run, we got our post-workout protein, and it's 9 a.m. We've got the rest of the day ahead. So then what? What are we what are we looking at for the rest of our day? How are we supposed to eat? I think this is a complex question. I'm kind of just throwing at you guys to start the conversation because we have a lot of different avenues to to take it down. But um, either one of you, what what then? I guess I'll start because I know <laughs> we all can chime in on this. Um, so first and foremost, I think Scott touched on this earlier, is protein. Protein comes first for me. As an athlete, you need to make sure that you're recovering, and that means sustained protein throughout the day. So um, the recommendation, especially as you get older, like you said, um, over 40, is one gram of protein per pound of body weight. So that's a huge amount. I want to emphasize that real quick. One gram per pound of body weight, not per kilogram, per pound of body weight, right? Right. So if you look at like the standard dietary recommendations, it's like, I don't know, 60 grams of protein is like the, it's the amount to prevent disease is what they're saying. So like you won't get sick if you have more than, you know, it's 60 grams, but you're also not going to thrive as an athlete or as a human or anything else um, at that level. That's like the minimum basis to not get sick. Um, so you need one gram per pound of body weight. And honestly, that can even go up the more intense your training is, you know, how much training you're doing. And that's like a whole other conversation, but minimum one gram per pound. So if you're 150 pounds, that means you're eating 150 grams of protein per day. And a lot of people are like, how on earth am I supposed to get that in? And it takes a lot of discipline. Um, but breaking that up throughout the day. So like 30 grams at every meal, you have 30 grams in your protein shake. And if you're 150 pounds, that means you have 120 left. So you have, you know, three meals and a snack. Each of those should have 30 grams of protein in them. And that's just kind of a cheat without having to count every macro. You can say, I need 30 grams of protein in each meal. Um, and, you know, that's, it can look a million different ways. There's so many good sources of protein out there. Um, you want to kind of stick to whole foods when you can. Um, you know, I, I guess, you know, then you're the next thing I, the next thing I tell athletes to worry about is their carbohydrates. So the next thing is making sure well, you get carbohydrates. Before in there. we move on to carbohydrates, can I interrupt you real quick um, yep. on, come, before we move on from protein? Um, I think looking at that big number that we're trying to reach a, a gram per pound to a lot of people, again, that's a huge number. Um, so <laughs> let's talk about like, for, for yourself, for each of you, what kind of stuff are you eating to get that protein? in there. It's to emphasize what you said, we're not necessarily just having 
you know, you've got your shake and then you're having the rest of your protein. It's an all day process. So we've got lunch, we've got a snack, we've got dinner. What kinds of things are you guys eating that are protein focused to help you get toward that number? Yeah. yeah. So, oh, go ahead, Scott. You go, uh, you go next. Well, I was just going to say, like, I, 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 I think that in my brain, I'm a planner. Um, I think I've brought up planning a few times today is I have to plan out what that is right so how am i going to get it in if i didn't plan it i would never get in enough protein i just wouldn't but for me um i do like uh to eat meat so i like uh jerky so any any type of jerky jerky beef jerky turkey jerky whatever um that's easy it's portable doesn't have to be refrigerated um i will sometimes take a, another protein shake um to the office in a in like a cooler bag um because it's a lot um I, but I, I try to get something in each meal. So, for example, if I'm going to say, hey, I'm going to make a salad for lunch, I'm going to throw some sort of protein on top of it. If I'm going to, um, I don't know, have pasta you know, for dinner, I don't really eat pasta too much. But, you know, I almost intentionally have to think about what am I going to put on this food item, right? Whether it's a, it's a meal or a snack that has some sort of protein. And for me, you know, I, I like meat. So it's gonna be your your chickens, your fish, um, you know, like I said, some, some jerky, um, but it's intentional and I've got to plan it out. Um, and, and I have to really almost force myself on each, in each meal. I don't wanna say force myself, that's kind of a, a bad phrase, but um, planning it out. But but for me specifically, yeah, the meats, the, the chickens, the fishes, you know, that's that that, that works for me. Yeah. And that's, I mean, it's similar to what I do. Um, I'll have like several eggs later in the afternoon um, with some fruit as a, you know, breakfast after my protein shake. Um, but again, it tastes like two, three eggs to get baseline. And then I have to add to that as well. Um, and then like lunch, I'll have either a salad with meat on top, like a steak, chicken, fish, like, um, and also another hard boiled egg usually on top of that. Um, you know, and sometimes beans, beans are a good vegetarian source that you can throw in there. And then my snack is usually another yogurt or, um, kefir fermented drink that I'll drink with, um, some flavorings in it. Um, and then my on the go, this is like not an ad. I don't, I want to make this clear. Cause I'm going to like say a brand name, but, um, there's a, when I'm busy and I have work days and I take meals to work, there's a company I found called factor and they have like on the go whole food meals that have 30 plus grams of protein. So that's like been my go-to. I've been ordering from them like once a week to get just enough to take on the road. And they have like some meals that aren't refrigerated that I can take to baseball practice and stuff for dinners. Um, but then dinners, you know, that's where I kind of have the variety. My, my entire day up to dinner is pretty much the same every day. Very boring. Um, and then dinner is where I kind of mix it up because, you know, I have my kids and try to make some meals that can be modified for each of our likes and tastes and diet. Um, but usually, like you said, it has a meat involved and like some vegetables and carbs, um, kind of mixed in there. And I kind of backload my carbs towards the end of the day as well. So that it gets me through sleep. Um, but I track my calories most days, not every day. And if I'm short on protein, I've found like my new go-to at night is, um, from the feed, I found it, it's casein powder, which is a type of protein that's like longer acting versus whey that's a fast acting protein. And I'll drink that at night with like a decaf coffee and maybe some like cinnamon or cocoa powder mixed in and it's like a nice soothing nighttime drink where that has another bonus 25 30 grams of protein that will kind of get you through the evening hours so um like you said i eat almost the same things that you eat <laughs> just uh, little variations here but you know it's, it's you have to be intentional you have to think about what you're going to put with that meal to get to that 30 grams of protein and it takes a lot of planning but I will say this, yeah. I will say in, in from, from experience, yes, and it, it's intentional, it takes some planning. Um, but coming from somebody who really struggled with that um, it, just recently, it's become routine. Um, you know, there's there's still days that it's difficult, you know, especially after a super long, you know, long run on the weekend, but um, it gets easier. It's gotten easier for me. So a little bit of um, effort in the upfront, you know, it does become easier. Yeah. I, I really love that. And I just want to emphasize again that there is nothing wrong with routine. Routine is a good thing and it is okay to eat the same lunch every day. <laughs> and I like, uh, Michelle, you emphasize this, that my most of my day is pretty routine. I have the same thing or the same rotation of things. And then dinner is where I leave room for creativity. Um, and I think for a lot of people, 
that works. Dinner is kind of the meal that you're usually sharing with more than just your lunches for yourself. Snacks are for yourself most of the time. Whereas dinner is a shared meal for a lot of people um, and is a lot easier to get that variety and have a little bit of, of you know, each night is maybe different. Um, yeah, I, routine is important. I, so I am kind of laughing as you guys are saying this. I have the same lunch every single day. It doesn't change at, at all. And I love it. I look forward to it. And that's just, that's what it is. You will never see me eating something different. So my go-to is a sandwich. I love a sandwich. Um, and I get, you know, I've got a, a whole grain bread. I'm getting a good dose of carbohydrates with my two slices of bread. Um, in the summer, I won't advertise this as the healthiest option, but it is convenient. I do deli meat. Um, I do roasted turkey breast um, that is high in sodium, but gosh, I need that sodium in the summer, so I'm not worried about it. Um, and I've got lettuce on there, uh, or not lettuce, uh, spinach that I put on there, and I put mayo on there too. Um, and I just like, I love that sandwich. I look forward to it every day and it's very complete. Um, but it's a, a good hearty dose of protein when I'm putting that. Uh, lunch meat on there. In the winter, I will take the same exact thing, but I switch to eggs because for whatever reason, eggs feel cozier and comfier in, when it's cold outside um, and just something a little bit different. So that is my lunch every single day. And unless I'm on vacation or going out to lunch, you will never see me eating something different. <laughs> um, snacks. Um, I Same as you guys, I try to sort of balance like, um, so I usually eat lunch really early. I, I work out early. I am doing a lot of miles in the morning. So by the time I've had my shake, I'm usually hungry again and having that sandwich at 1030, maybe 11. Um, so then I'm having probably two or sometimes maybe more snacks um, throughout the day before I get to dinner time. So I will try to make one snack protein focused, one snack carbohydrate focused, because I'm also trying to get my carbohydrates up for the next day's run or to replenish from the earlier days run. Um, so protein related snacks, I, Scott, I'm with you. I love jerky. It is convenient. It is easy. You can get even the single serving packs to take with you. Um, Greek yogurt is another that I really, really like very high in protein. Um, and just, you know, the little cups, you can get the, like the Oikos triple zero, I think is, is the one that we usually get. And it's like 25 grams of protein in the little cup and it doesn't have added sugars. A lot of the general yogurt section that you see can be like really high in sugar, especially the kid focused stuff. So don't buy that for your kids. It's so bad. Um, <laughs> look for something that's a little bit lower in sugar and a little bit higher focus on the protein. Um, I also, this is a complete guilty pleasure. Um, and I will usually have it either as a snack or sometimes I'll have it as dessert. If I haven't met my protein needs for the day, um, quest bars, I love Quest bars. They're so delicious. Um, they have roughly 20 grams of protein in, in their standard bar. Um, they're not perfectly clean ingredients. I'm not trying to be perfectly clean most of the time, um, but they do. They are protein focused as the largest macronutrient in there, and it they taste really good. It's like a treat. Um, so those are like a favorite, like a quick grab if I'm running out the door, I need something to throw in my purse um, or something at the end of the day if I need to boost up my protein just a little bit or I'm craving dessert and I don't want to have um, something that's high in sugar or something like that. Um, and then for, for a carby snack, well, we're not on carbs yet. We won't get to that part. We're focusing yeah, we'll on like protein related snacks. I, on long run days or workout days, I will treat myself to like actual ice cream, not like the ones that have a bunch of chemicals in it, but like we have an awesome ice cream. Real ice now. cream. Yeah. Like real homemade ice cream. And it, you'd be surprised how much protein. I mean, there is definitely sugar, but I did hear, and this is like a side note, one of the podcasts I listened to was just saying how it promotes longevity because of like the probiotics and ice cream and real ice cream. So now I'm like, it's a health food. It's 100% health food. So like <laughs> once or twice a week. I love it. It's protein and it's awesome and it tastes good and it's enjoyable. And like, if you're short on those long run days, or even as a bonus protein, it's like a really good option because it's, you know, ice cream. Totally. Ice I like cream. it. <laughs> enjoy, <laughs> right? Like that's part of the per point too is enjoy. Treat yourself right. to those kinds of things sometimes. Yeah. Um, so I think I think that was another good point that was emphasized in here is tracking. Um and I think that we'll get into this a little bit, but but I think it is really helpful if you are not sure 
uh, where you are falling in the nutrition that you need or, um, you know, protein specifically, we're talking about this big protein number that is important for you to reach um, as an athlete, as a person, a healthy person in general. Um, if, if we're looking at a week, this is the macronutrient that doesn't really change. You, you are aiming for consistent protein intake most days of the week um, with, you know, maybe a little bit of variation. You're, you are probably really not going to know what you're doing unless you track it. That doesn't mean you need to track every day of your life. But if you take like a week to track what you are eating as your routine things, the things that are, are go-tos for you. Um, so you can see where you fall and you can see what you can do to be working toward that one gram per pound of body weight. But if you are just eyeballing it and guessing and um, tr trying to just wing it, there's a great chance that you're not hitting it correctly. Um, and, and it can be really, really helpful to track what you're putting in your body, even just for a brief period of time to see what you're doing so that you know where to go. Um, and, and I can't emphasize that enough that it makes a big difference just to try it. Everybody hates it. Nobody likes it. So if you hate tracking, you are not alone. I'm not telling you to enjoy it. I'm telling you to give it a try anyway, because you can't know where you are if you don't look at where you are uh, with a realistic look at the math um, tracking. So let's go, I interrupted you like 10 minutes ago. Um, <laughs> talking about protein snacks. Let's move on to carbohydrates. Yeah, so, you know, daily, that's gonna be, that's a highly dependent topic. And I think that's another full on subject we could just go into by itself, but carbohydrates vary a lot based on where you are in your training cycle. Um, you know, what you're training for. But generally speaking, the higher your load, the more carbohydrates you're also going to need to split up throughout the day. Um, you know, if you're in build or peak training, like there's going to be a lot of carbs, your body's going to need closer to that max number of carbs. Um, you know, you might need three, 400 grams of carbs per day, depending on your body weight, which is a ridiculous many carbs. <laughs> but when you're in peak training, that's what you need. Whereas when you're in, you know, base training or you're injured, you might need 150 grams of carbs per day. It's a, that's the most variable part of any diet. I think for an athlete is carbs, like your fat and protein stay the same. Your carbs are going to go way up, go way down. And then even throughout the week, like if you have a hard workout the next day, you need to have a mini carb load the night before, um, just to make sure you're, you're topped off. And then you need to replenish them after your hard workouts, after your long runs. Um, so it's very cyclical. And that's where I think a lot of confusion comes in. Um, I know we might talk about this, you know, coming up, but like, you know, when you see stuff on certain social media about low carb diets versus high carb diets or low fat versus high fat, it's very specific to your specific type of training, your body type, your metabolism. Um, and again, it's a trial and error, um, because people have different metabolisms, even elite, you know, runners, distance runners will have very different metabolisms where somebody needs a lot more carbohydrates versus than another person. So, um, I don't even know where to go within this topic from here. No, I think it's so variable. It's very, um, I think that's the main point right, right there is, um, you know, like we, like we mentioned, and, and you mentioned again, your protein and, and your fat, we didn't quite talk about fat yet, but those are pretty stable. They are, those are your needs pretty much every day, pretty much all year. Like that, those are healthy body needs. Um, and it's your carbohydrates that are going to change. So again, getting back to tracking and and why that can be so helpful and so important is to know what where your carbohydrates are supposed to be um i before we got on this call i i said up front and we were all in agreement we're not going to sit on this call and give you a macronutrient number or percentage or something like that that you are supposed to be reaching because it's different for everybody it's different on the day it's different on the month on the point of the training cycle um so there is you can't give a one number or one percentage that you are supposed to be reaching on any day. Um, however, you can get a good gauge on where you want to be if you are tracking. So if you have a, a nutrition tra tracking app, um, and we had a little bit of a debate on this before the, before the call, um, but if you are syncing it with your, if you are syncing your nutrition track tracking app with your activity tracker. So your Garmin, your Coros, whatever, you put those two pieces together and there's a lot of different um, apps that you can use for this service. We, the, 
as a as a coaching team, we really like Chronometer. Um, it's just really easy to use and and pretty clean of ads and junk and stuff in there. Um, but this is going to give you that picture of how many roughly. It's it's also important to mention neither your activity tracker nor the nutrition labels on your food are perfectly accurate to the number of calories you're burning or the number of calories you're taking in. It's important to recognize these are estimates, not perfection. But you are getting a good picture on a daily basis of how many calories you are expending as energy throughout your day, your whole day, not just your run, but your 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 basal metabolic rate in addition to the workouts that you're doing in addition to the, just the daily activities. And then you can see where, okay, these are my daily protein needs. That's getting me this number of calories. I'm taking in this many calories of fat. We haven't super emphasized that yet. We're going to get into it in another podcast before this turns into a two hour show. Um, and then carbohydrates are filling in the rest of that. And so you can actually see that in the app how many calories you need to be filling in um, or, or reaching toward for your, your carbohydrate needs. Um, and again, if you're not tracking that, it's very difficult to know what you need. I think um, without going too much into it, intuitive eating as an athlete when you are training is not a reliable method of fueling your body. When you are training, it's very common, especially on your heaviest days, that your appetite is really low and you can't necessarily trust your intuition to fuel the way that your body actually needs. Um, so fueling intuitively as an athlete is not a reliable method. Um, and, and something we'll get into sort of along the same track is uh, one of the questions that we got um, from our run squad members was how to fuel differently on a rest day versus a long run day versus a workout day um, in terms of your daily nutrition. We already talked specifically about around your run. Um, let me let me throw that question to to one of you guys. Do you need to fuel differently on different days of the week um, and or how does that balance out how do we how do we approach that yeah i would say for for me yes um if i look at it in the week in terms of what is my workout what is my run that day right so i know on tuesday or wednesday that's going to be a hard workout and saturday is going to be a long run right and so i'm focusing on carbohydrates for example the day before and the day of those two two days, right? Let's say my my wor workout is on a Wednesday, Tuesday into Wednesday, and then after that that workout on Wednesday, I'm going to be focused heavily on carbs. The carbs are going to go up. Um, same thing with the long run um, on Saturday, Friday going into Saturday, and, and then Saturday. And not to say that I'm, you know, dismissing and going you know, super low carb during those other days, but I put an emphasis on it. Um, and back to the whole tracking. I've used a, 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 a calorie tracker long enough to know kind of where I'm at, right, in that kind of shift up and down. Um, so that's for me, what I would say are the two critical points is going to be, you know, the hard workouts, speed sessions, intervals, whatever, midweek, and then long runs. Those two key harder efforts for me. Yeah. And then I build around that kind of a little slope around it. Yeah, I'm, you know, I'm similar with my carbs. I they could like definitely cycle up before and after hard workouts and long runs. But as far as my rest day, I keep them pretty similar to my easy run days. Um, like I don't really change anything on my rest day because honestly, I'm just as hungry on my re recovery days because I've worked hard all week. And I think that, you know, when you average out the week, I, I, I don't, I think you're recovering. So you still need the fuel. So your body recoups for the rest of the upcoming week. So, you know, I think um, typically my training cycle is six days on and one day off. And that one day off, I need to re-up for the next week um because you're training hard so I, I think that recovery day just that it's recovery and if you're not fueling for that you're not going to recover um so i don't really change too much on my recovery days except it's not going to be as high carb as the workout days and the long run days michelle i and and it brings up a question in terms of um you know i mentioned the two days inside of a week that i look at and i'm really focused on that but should we be looking at the whole week as a whole, right? As maybe more important than just those two individual days. They're they're important, you know, separately, right? But kind of how do I look at the whole week? 
And that's a really good question. Um, so you, but it, the answer is both. You need to look at them individually. It's, it's just like your training cycle. So when we structure training, you have your individual days of training, you have your week of training, and then you have your entire cycle and your phases of training. So the, your food is just the same. So you need to focus on those daily requirements as well. But, you know, then the rest of your days should be like, okay, like you know, fairly similar outside of those hard workouts and prepared for that, preparing for those and recovering as well as your hard workouts. But then, um, you know, there's going to be times where you eat maybe a little more or a little less on those other days of the week. And that's how it should be, really. I mean, you need the days to go out and enjoy family events or, you know, you're going to a wedding or you're just going to go out with your friends to let go and have those extra calories and those extra you know, the extra fuel and then maybe like back off on another day. Or if you know, for example, like we talked about after a race, I know I'm not hungry that entire day. It's like force feeding myself because I don't want to eat. So the next day it's a rest day. So I shouldn't eat as much fuel, but actually I eat more on that rest day than I did the day of the race, because that's when my kind of appetite kicks in and I'm recovering. So it's the week as a whole, as well as like those individual days. So they're both how you look at your week, if that makes sense. I hope I'm explaining that the right way. Like, no, you did. Sense. I think yeah. you said that really well. And I think, I, again, that ties into the intuitive eating piece that um, we, and where tracking can be helpful is to see, you know, on a long run day, on a race day, you're putting out some crazy calorie expenditure. You are using a lot of energy to do long runs and, and big efforts. And it is so common after such a big effort to not have an appetite. Like it, intuitively you could go that day without eating. Um, and suddenly if you're looking at the numbers and tracking them, you could have a, a 3000 calorie deficit on your day, on your long run. So to, to make sure that your, your hormones and your system are staying in balance, you've got to balance that out somewhere. That's not to say that you need to exactly meet, I'm burning this many calories, I need to eat this many calories. Those don't necessarily have to be equal, but looking at the big picture of the week that you should still be eating plenty on your rest days because you almost certainly probably are not eating enough on your long, your big effort days, your multi-hour um, long run days. So those those balance out and looking at the big picture is important. And I think seeing those numbers, uh, like I said, nobody wants to track every day, all day, forever. But if you can do it for a little bit just to see what it looks like and get a sense of what your body is doing day to day, week to week, and then use that to hmm. be more intuitive with the data that you're looking at and collecting, um, I think can be really helpful for a lot of people. Yeah. And even picking that um, up here and there. Like if you stop for a while, yeah. like I, I noticed I'll track for a couple of weeks until I get myself back on track for this current part of my cycle. And then I'll drop it for a while once I feel like I've got it nailed. And then like when build picks up, I'm like, oh shoot, I don't think I'm eating enough. And then we track again. And then, you know, recovery, I, I noticed I'm usually eating too much. <laughs> so, you know, you put on a few pounds after that race and realize you got to dial it back. So it works throughout the cycle, just as check-ins. So I want to, we are getting pretty long on this episode already. Um, there is another topic we want to dive into. Um, and this was a question we got about sort of like the diet culture and the social media stuff that you see out there. Like, how do you know what is good advice? What is bad advice? What you should, shouldn't, what, what is, there's so much out there. Um, I actually, though, I wanted to make sure to mention it so that the people who asked those questions um, know that we didn't forget it. We're not skipping it. But I actually think it ties in really well with our next podcast episode. Um, and since this one is getting really long, I, I want to push that off to the next episode. Um, but hopefully what we have covered so far, again, we really kind of started with a general concept of nutrition for the athlete for the runner. Um, and, and we have more episodes planned on this topic to go in some more specific directions. Um, and, and we've got uh, another episode coming up that is talking about sort of that social media external pressure also. Um, so we'll stop, we'll stop here and not get too much further into the weeds on, on this topic. Um, so does that sound good to you guys? Yeah. Perfect. 
Okay. All right. So we will wrap it up here. Um, thanks for joining us for, this is our first podcast on nutrition. Um, however, you can also find some good information on our YouTube channel uh, before we started the official podcast format. We've got some good short form um, educational content on there for you. So you can find us on YouTube at More Miles Run Coaching. You can also find us on Facebook and Instagram at the same at More Miles Run Coaching. Or our website is More Miles to Go. Dot com and you can find out all about us individually as a team and what we do on that website. Um, please feel free to leave a comment um, on this episode. I know there are going to be questions and, and things that we can expand upon. So please don't be shy. Ask us a question either in a comment or in a direct message or via email. Um, okay. Thanks for joining me, guys. We, we went pretty long on this one. Um, so I think we're all ready for dinner. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right. Have a good night. Bye. Bye.